the slasher film. Following the release of John Carpenter's seminal Halloween in 1978, the slasher genre exploded in popularity during the 1980s. Two years later, Friday the 13th would follow, while A Nightmare on Elm Street introduced audiences to the nightmarish world of Freddy Krueger. This new take on horror captivated audiences around the world. You know what else was captivating audiences though? Video games. From the dark arcades of the early 80s to Nintendo Mania that followed in its wake, video games dominated the home entertainment market like nothing before. It should come as no surprise then that inevitably, slasher films and video games would meet. Enter Splatterhouse. Born from the golden age of slasher flicks, Splatterhouse offers arcade goers a different kind of vision, an experience built on terror. Dark, horror-themed stages steeped in violence shocked players who were lucky enough to walk up to the arcade cabinet. And today on DF Retro, we're diving into this dark, sinister world of Splatterhouse to explore every entry in the series. From the Namco System 1-powered arcade version and all subsequent ports, through the 2010 release on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. We'll even examine the more obscure iterations of the game. This is the definitive look at the history, technology, and horror behind the series. So, load that shotgun and join me in West Mansion for this episode of DF Retro. Nineteen seventy-eight was a pivotal year in the world of entertainment. It was the year during which John Carpenter unleashed the aforementioned Halloween on unsuspecting audiences. It was the year Taito hit it big with Space Invaders, and also the year that Namco would release its very first internally developed video game, GB. This smooth blend of pinball and block breaking marks the beginning of Namco's long legacy in the video game space. And what followed in its wake was a wide range of colorful, addictive games, including the smash hit Galaxian, the groundbreaking Pac-Man, and the stunning pseudo three-dimensional racing game Pole Position. By the time Namco unleashed Splatterhouse in 1988, the Japanese developer had cemented itself as one of the best in the business, but Splatterhouse was different. Until that point, nonsensical but extraordinarily delightful names such as Grobda, Bosconian, and Baraduke, among many others, had previously dominated Namco's catalog of games. The name Splatterhouse is comparatively straightforward and rather descriptive. One glance at the blood-soaked title screen will tell you everything you need to know about what follows when you press that start button. If you were lucky enough to stumble upon a Splatterhouse cabinet in your local arcade, congratulations! You were among the first in the world to experience video game violence. Distorted piano notes echo out, contrasted against the groans of nightmarish enemies while a droning synthesizer pours out across a haunting dining room. The feeling of deftly swinging your meat cleaver through monster flesh while making your way through West Mansion is never not satisfying. Now, it may seem quaint by modern standards, but Splatterhouse brought a lot of firsts, and almost firsts, to the table. As noted, Splatterhouse is one of the first examples of a violent video game, which means it was also one of the first to receive a parental warning regarding its content, at least in the home version. Splatterhouse also incorporated horror and slasher film elements into its core design, something that had never fully been explored before in the video game space. For those unfamiliar with the game though, let's start by answering a simple question. What is Splatterhouse? It is, at its core, a side-scrolling brawler of the pre-Final Fight variety, with a focus on timing and positioning. You make your way across the multitude of stages using a mix of fists, feet and weapons to dominate foes while leaping over hazards to reach the hideous final boss. 
It features seven primary stages, with certain stages offering the player multiple paths based on either choice or failure. Released in 1988, it's also one of the last games to stem from the school of design initiated by Irem's Spartan X back in 1984. By this point, games such as Double Dragon had initiated a sea change in the design of brawlers by opening up Z movement. Spartan X and its ilk were instead designed around a single field of play, with a focus on timing. Other popular takes in the genre include Taito's The Ninja Warriors, and later, Thunder Fox, as well as Sega's popular but less refined Altered Beast, which released the same year as Splatterhouse itself. With the 1989 release of Final Fight from Capcom, however, most developers had abandoned the single plane style of brawling in favor of this new approach, which I kind of feel is a shame. The thing is, by this point Namco had experimented with this style of game before Splatterhouse, which helps explain its refinement, I think. Released in 1986, Genpei Tomaden is one of the more popular examples. This game follows a dead samurai on his quest to rebuild the clans across Japan. It features multiple playstyles, including an overhead view and two side-scrolling brawling variants, very much in the style of Spartan X again. The following year, Namco followed this up with Wonder Momo, a parody on popular television tropes of the era which sees players controlling Kanda Momo in a stage play of sorts while fending off baddies. Each of these games features themes from TV and film, an important thing to keep in mind, along with the side-scrolling brawling formula of this era. While they achieved popularity, the controls and hit detection are perhaps less engaging and refined than one might hope. Splatterhouse has all the hallmarks of refinement in comparison. Every swing of your weapon, each splat of hideous monster feels pitch perfect. When combined with satisfying sound design, it's a game that just feels great to play. The key to any great action game, really. While Double Dragon may have represented the next step in the brawler genre, it was unrefined and unresponsive next to Splatterhouse's precision. Now, the primary driving force behind a great side-scrolling action game like Splatterhouse stems from its rhythm. Knowing when to jump, attack, or duck is central to its design. Later brawlers with Z movement felt comparatively cheap. It would become nearly impossible to avoid taking damage, but Splatterhouse rewards skilled play. You can learn and master this game. It has just the right amount of intensity and pattern recognition to feel satisfying. As you make your way through West Mansion then, you encounter a range of designs and scenarios inspired by pop culture of this era. It is this which, I feel, sets Splatterhouse apart. So then, when looking into the history of what gives Splatterhouse its unique and macabre visuals, we gotta go back to the past to see the things that made plagiarism so vast. By the time that the 1980s rolled around, the rising art phenomenon that was H.R. Giger skyrocketed into fame for his work on Ridley Scott's Alien, which was heavily based on his designs from the Necronomicon art collection, and whose work you can definitely see reflected in Splatterhouse's overall design. The nightmarish, surreal terror of his images and landscapes can absolutely be seen in the visual makeup of Splatterhouse, though Giger is far from the only inspiration from the art world, as the works of Jackson Pollock and Francis Bacon certainly seem to have left an impression on the dev team as well. But there are perhaps no greater source of inspiration to Splatterhouse than that of the cinema, a term that largely denotes the B-movie genre in Japan. With the popularization of VHS in the early 1980s, the booming rental market exploded in Japan with a new, cheap alternative to watch films in the comfort of one's home, and became one of the most popular pastimes during Christmas season especially. This also meant that audiences would need greater, faster choice comparatively to going to the theaters, and their interests were much more specific in the films they chose. 
This allowed for cheaper international films to make their appearance in Japan at a much faster rate, as more simple dialogue meant much easier translations, and the younger audiences that came with the rental market were much more willing to consume simple cheap entertainment with only subtitle options, allowing the works of people such as Toby Hooper, Sam Raimi, and franchises such as Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street to capture the attention of cult cinema audiences in Japan. At a glance, you can quickly see how those particular directors and film franchises would come to inspire the design of Splatterhouse. The Living Furniture, Haunted House, The Hockey Mask Wearing Brute, The Bloodshed and Grotesque Mayhem. All of these elements do show similarities to movies such as The Evil Dead, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, characters such as Jason Voorhees, and real-life murderers that inspired slasher villains. It's fairly obvious on a surface level. However, it might just be the works of Lucio Fulci, the Italian schlockmeister which had the most profound impact on the game. By the time of development, Fulci had already gained a small audience in Japan thanks to his cult release of Zombie 2. But it is in particular Fulci's House by the Cemetery that seems to have had a large impact on Splatterhouse overall designs, extending even into the music as Tajima Katsuro and Kawamoto Yoshinori's work seem to bear a strong resemblance to that of Walter Rizzati's score for House by the Cemetery. In all, it's fun to see just how widespread the many homages that Splatterhouse contains truly are. It's a schlock fest combining terrifying expressionist art, B-movie slashers, Italian giallo, and Japanese spiritualism. It's a chaotic mess that somehow perfectly works together. The V-cinema genre of films is an often overlooked staple of Japanese game development in the 80s, and would have a heavy hand in inspiring the likes of Final Fight, Street Fighter 2, and even official film classics such as Hudson Hawk. But Splatterhouse might just be the finest example of expressionism, film, and entertainment blending together seamlessly in a video game of this era. But as we explored inspiration of what gives Splatterhouse's visual identity out of the way, it's time to head back into the mansion to see what lies beneath the surface and see what lurks underneath the horrifying exterior. Like most of Namco's productions during the 80s, Splatterhouse is first and foremost a game rooted in the arcade. The industry was in a state of transformation during the late 80s and a push towards 16-bit and 3D graphics, but Splatterhouse utilizes Namco's System 1 board instead. This board is powered by multiple Motorola 6809 CPUs. It's one of the more capable 8-bit CPUs ever made, outclassing the capabilities of any home console at this time. The board delivers its graphics at a full 288 by 224 resolution with support for multi-plane scrolling, a sizable color palette, loads of on-screen sprites, and multiple sound chips, among other aspects. It was first introduced in 1987, powering a game known as Yokai Dochuki, a platform game which follows a young boy on his journey through Jigoku. This was followed up with the vertical shooter Dragon Spirit, which was highly popular during this era, as well as the tank combat game Blazer. These are just some of the games that would appear on Namco System 1 hardware. Splatterhouse, though, is one of the more unique games due to its perspective. You see the camera is zoomed closely into the action, which requires large sprites and meticulously detailed pixel art to pull off effectively. It makes use of the hardware by pushing a large number of these sprites along with animated background objects without any visible flicker or real slowdown. It also takes full advantage of the wider color palette available for smooth color gradients. The only visual caveat I would raise lies in the lack of parallax background scrolling, something the hardware is absolutely capable of, suggesting it was more of an artistic vision more than anything else. The audio then is another aspect worth discussing. What sets Splatterhouse apart is its unique horror-themed soundscape, with an unusual selection of music tracks combined with digital audio. There's nothing upbeat about the soundtrack in Splatterhouse, it's rich and atmospheric by design. Now, hardware-wise, Namco System 1 utilizes the Yamaha YM2151, a pair of custom DACs, 
and a custom chip for handling digital sampled audio. In Splatterhouse, the music primarily leans on FM synthesis playback, creating some haunting melodies in the process. Audio samples, then, are used for sound effects in short voice clips like this. It's powerful and evocative, delivering a sense of unease that remains just as engaging today as it ever was. But the themes driving the action are perhaps even more meaningful than you might expect. Hey, it's me. I'm Derek. I've always held that Splatterhouse, well, not the first video game with blood and guts, was the first good one. I'll leave all the technical talk to the experts here, but allow me a moment to dive deeper into the game itself and explain why it is a landmark experience and one of Namco's greatest titles. And spoiler alert, I am about to spoil a 35-year-old game. Warning, here we go. And it does require a bit of a deep dive because the true brilliance of Splatterhouse doesn't come into focus until the later half of the game when it finally shows its hand. What is at first an extremely entertaining, relatively mindless gore fest slowly grows more subtly complex and demanding. Level design is consistently creative with new challenges and set pieces, and it's just a nonstop roller coaster of amazing creature design and atmospheric music. On a surface level, Splatterhouse is just good trashy fun, but there is more for the player hiding beneath the viscera. Things culminate not at the final boss, though it is a sight to behold for sure, but the fifth level boss. After a multi-path gauntlet, which I say is the hardest part of the game, we finally reach Jennifer, Rick's girlfriend. However, before Rick can take her by the hand and run out of the house to safety, she begins violently and painfully transforming into a hideous beast. Her screams of pain give way to a chilling laugh, and she lunges at Rick. A few successful strikes will cause her to revert to her human self just long enough for her to beg you for help or to kill her. In the arcade version, at least, I've never been sure exactly what she's saying, though in the home port, she is clearly saying, help me, before she again violently hulks out and resumes attacking you. It is a decent twist by most any standard, but for an arcade game made in 1988, it was unheard of. Victory in this fight does not exorcise the demon from her body or cure her. She dies. In the arcade version, she thanks you and says goodbye before wisping away. In the home port, uh, her body just dissolves in Rick's hands. And though by the end you have successfully destroyed this house of splatter, Rick has only his sorrows as the house burns behind him. There is no celebration as the credits roll. It doesn't even say thanks for playing. In fact, after the credits finish, the mask returns and laughs at you. It's like, okay, geez, dude, we get it. The real genius of Splatterhouse is this sleight of hand, and only a game with such an outrageous and fully realized style could get away with it. You dropped in a quarter or pressed the run button, wanting nothing more than to bash monsters with a 2x4 and save your girl. And why not? It's the late 80s. Video games are all about fun, right? Instead, victory is your beloved dead by your hands and a lonely walk home as the house collapses. And sure, maybe you did have fun, but the game clearly illustrates that our hero Rick did not. This dark twist is one of the first times a video game created a schism between the player and the character. Splatterhouse told a story, and it did it by deliberately tricking the player, leaving a lasting impact. And while the second game is my personal favorite of the bunch, this moment is probably the reason I love Splatterhouse, and it taught me from an early age what this medium was capable of, both graphically and emotionally. And I will always respect Splatterhouse for that. Plus, it also got ported to a bunch of really weird places and would develop its own surprisingly deep lore in the sequels. It's just a fascinating series. But that's enough out of me. Again, hey, I am Derek. I toss it back over to you, John. Thanks. By this point, we've hopefully established what makes Splatterhouse stand out for 1988. From its visual and gameplay design to its cinematic inspirations, it was a unique experience for the day. It was also a notable success. It was only a matter of time then that Namco would look towards the home console market. Personal Computer PC 9800 Series NEC PC 8801 Mark II 
Computers and Communications, NEC. The 1980s saw an explosion in the rise of one very important area of technology, the personal computer. In the West, IBM personal computers reigned supreme, but in Japan, things were different. While a multitude of companies and standards existed, it was NEC that owned the lion's share of the market thanks to its PC-88 and PC-98 computer systems. NEC was a monolith, one of Japan's most prolific technology creators, especially during this particular era, and its personal computers were one of its crown jewels. While these machines were built using Intel CPUs and ran a variant of MS-DOS, they were not fully compatible with the IBM PC standard of the West. Differences in the BIOS, the video, and memory subsystems meant that the NEC platform was uniquely tailored towards the Japanese audience. So when NEC teamed up with Hudson to release its very own video game console to compete with Nintendo's successful Famicom, people took notice. This minuscule 8-bit system found a huge audience in Japan, putting up a reasonable fight against the Famicom at the time. NEC would produce a wide range of variants, including a CD-ROM format, making it one of the first consumer-focused CD-ROM-based products for games. In North America, however, NEC launched the machine as the TurboGrafx-16, where it failed to find any serious audience. While Nintendo and Sega battled it out for supremacy in the West, the TG-16 was a distant third. A reversal from Japan where PC Engine stood instead as a strong number two against Sega's less than successful Mega Drive. This is where Namco comes in. Following a public feud between Namco and Nintendo regarding the business practices around the Famicom, Namco sought to bring their wares to other competing platforms. They didn't cease production of Famicom games, obviously, but clearly their focus had shifted. And PC Engine is one of the primary platforms Namco would stand behind, with a huge selection of ports made for the system. Many of its arcade classics such as Dragon Spirit, Yokai Dochuki, Wonder Momo, Pac-Land, Galaga 88, and more made their way to the system. And in 1990, another major arcade conversion would arrive with the release of Splatterhouse for PC Engine. Powered by a 6502 microprocessor clocked at 7.16 MHz alongside a custom graphics unit, the PC Engine was firmly an 8-bit machine at heart, but its configuration pushed it far beyond what the Famicom or NES was capable of. More colors and larger sprites were both possible, making it a good fit for Namco's more advanced arcade games such as Splatterhouse. And it's here where it shines. This is not a perfect conversion but it's about as close as you could expect from a home console during this time. For starters, all of the content is here. It's nearly as bloody as the arcade original, and it looks darn good. Just like the arcade game, you'll make your way through seven stages, tackling massive bosses along the way while utilizing a wide range of weapons. It also sounds pretty good, making excellent use of the PC Engine's more limited audio hardware. Not quite to the same level of the arcade game, of course, but it has its own unique flavor. Which brings us to our next section, how does it actually compare to the arcade version? To answer this, I've prepared a full set of comparisons, starting right from the very beginning of the game. 
Now, at first glance, the character graphics appear remarkably close. Rick's sprite is slightly less detailed, but it feels authentic. Enemy graphics take a more significant hit in terms of detail, but they still manage to occupy a large portion of the screen. That said, in the arcade game, you begin with the meat cleaver, something which only appears later and in one stage on PC Engine. The conversion instead hands you a 2x4 at the beginning. The difference comes down to the way in which enemies are slaughtered. The meat cleaver basically slices their heads clean off, while the 2x4 smashes them against the background wall. It's a nice effect, but I'd imagine that the meat cleaver was removed in order to eliminate the need to draw the death animations from slicing their heads off. The overall stage layout is also comparable, with the same basic enemy patterns, spikes, and traps. The biggest visual difference, though, stems from the background tile work. It's simplified and visibly more tiled in order to work on the limitations of the PC Engine. It's missing the gnarled, broken prison bars and the various bloody corpses littering the ground, in addition to things like the wrecked piece of furniture just before you climb the ladder here at the end of the stage. This brings us to the first boss encounter then, which has you facing off against boar worms leaping through the air. The arcade version again features superior background detail and shading, but it's otherwise very close. After completing it though, we see the stage introduction panels, which also differ between arcade and PC Engine. Stage 2 then is closer, but it's still missing background details such as the shelves bolted to the walls and the smoother color gradients. You've probably also noticed by now that the game's HUD is missing the color gradients on PC Engine as well. Then the sewer. This is another similar story, reduced fidelity, but still reasonably comparable. The PC Engine version lacks the water droplets from the ceiling though. I do love this section though. Timing the jumps over these spiked balls while spacing out the creatures from beneath the water is always satisfying, and the PC Engine version retains this perfectly. The second boss fight then is one of my favorites in the game. With its eerie music, the room comes alive as you avoid and destroy possessed pieces of furniture. It definitely has more impact in the arcade version, but again, PC Engine holds its own, at least visually. We should discuss the audio again though. The PC Engine version utilizes much less sophisticated hardware and changes were necessary. That said, I am a fan of the way it sounds, but it is a very different experience. Take a listen. Sound effects though take a more noticeable hit, the sound of weapons colliding with the necks of your enemy, it's not quite as intense as in the original game. Also, some of the weird voice clips used are replaced entirely or removed. Now as we arrive in stage 3, it's worth noting that the lack of parallax scrolling in this arcade game ends up becoming sort of a positive thing for PC Engine. It does not natively support any such feature, making it more difficult to pull off, though many games would use it in some form or another. That said, it is missing the foreground trees present in the arcade game, but it could be argued that this improves visibility, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. Now Biggie Man, one of the best bosses in the game, is one of the more impressive examples of the sprite conversion work. He looks nearly on par with the arcade game, if not for the variation in background detail, would almost feel one to one in some ways. Very impressive work from the sprite artists. The only difference really lies in his death animation. In the arcade he just sort of falls to the ground, but he sort of fades out on PC Engine in comparison. By now I think you're starting to get a handle on the differences. Essentially, most stages pare down the background details while reducing the overall color palette in strategic ways. Like here, the texture for the wall is completely gone on PC Engine. Or how about the chapel, where flickering candles and smoother shading allow the arcade version to stand well above the PC Engine. The thing is, 
Back during this era, there wasn't really a way to just look up the arcade original, so I can imagine that this felt rather true to form when played at home, without the reference. Speaking of which, we've been looking thus far at the Japanese PC Engine version of Splatterhouse, but this game did also arrive on North American shores. TurboGrafx-16 received a version of Splatterhouse. Now, there are some differences here, but it's less than you might think. Firstly, the Terror Mask is colored red on TG-16 and features some design tweaks, likely to avoid any potential legal issues regarding the similarities to Jason Voorhees as first featured in 1980's Friday the 13th. Secondly, as was common during this period, all religious imagery has been removed. Crosses are absent from two different fights in the game and the altar at the end of the chapel boss fight is missing but the candles remain floating in mid-air. It's a little awkward. There was talk about censorship back in the day, but in reality, the violence level is identical between the two regions. Any reduction in overall violence is likely down to a reduction in the sprite density and complexity between the arcade and PC Engine version, not censorship. Another strange technical change between the Japanese and US version can be seen outside the play area. In the Japanese version, everything outside of the screen is black, so you don't have a border, something that can be visible even on a CRT. With the US release, however, there's now this dark shade of green framing the action for some reason. This creeps into the overscan area on your TV or appears when used with a device such as the RetroTINK 5X Pro, as we're doing here. Ultimately, Splatterhouse on PC Engine is one of my favorite conversions of this era. The expected cuts are all here, but it feels authentic and manages to play even better. This is a fine conversion and a nice showpiece for the console. But it wasn't the only port. Splatterhouse would also arrive on various other forms as well. Firstly, in 1992, courtesy of Ving, Splatterhouse made its appearance on Fujitsu's FM Town's line of personal computers in Japan. While not as popular as NEC's lineup, the FM Towns is a beautiful compact little machine built around an Intel 386 processor and capable graphics hardware that was extremely well suited for playing games. Unlike most PCs we know during this era in the West though, the FM Towns could actually display graphics in 15kHz, 24kHz, or 31 kilohertz, which means games like Splatterhouse on a real FM Towns can display in a proper 15 kilohertz 240p mode when configured properly. But there's another variant of the FM Towns system, the FM Towns Marty, a consoleized version of the FM Towns computer. Unfortunately, this machine only seems to support interlaced 480i output, likely to increase compatibility with a wide range of software and its best possible video output is just S-Video. That's what we're looking at now, by the way. What's interesting about the FM Towns platform is that games such as Splatterhouse can be played directly from a CD-ROM, just like a console. You pop the game in, fire it up on any of the FM Towns variants, and the game just starts right up. And what a port it is! Splatterhouse on FM Towns is legendary among fans of the series for the quality of this port, and when you play it, it's pretty clear why. It's nearly arcade perfect. There are some differences, of course. The FM Towns doesn't support the 288 pixel wide mode of the arcade game for starters, which means while it shares the same base artwork, the play area is slightly reduced. Certain areas actually feature scrolling as a result of this change. But the key is that the artwork itself remains unchanged. This looks like the arcade version, and it is fantastic. You know what else is fantastic? The sound. The original arcade soundtrack has been transplanted using CD Redbook audio, and it sounds exactly as it should. It's an effective choice here. If you browse into the options menu though, you'll find different graphics options available as well. Now, I believe that this just cycles between 15 kilohertz mode and perhaps a 31 kilohertz mode. It doesn't actually change the size of the display area. Unfortunately, none of these options work correctly on an FM Towns Marty, again, due to its video output limitations. 
Ultimately, Splatterhouse for FM Towns is the real deal. Many other famous ports such as Afterburner are, in reality, nowhere near as good as their arcade originals, but with Splatterhouse, it genuinely comes close to delivering the full experience at home with minimal compromise. All the pixel art is there, the sound is there, the violence is there, this is Splatterhouse for all intents and purposes. Following the release of the FM Towns version, we wouldn't see the original game for more than a decade. That is until 2003 when a PC version of the game was released exclusively for Japanese Windows computers. It's basically arcade perfect because, well, it seems to be the arcade version. If you browse the folders included on the CD, you'll find a folder featuring ROM files consistent with what you would use for, say, MAME. That's not to say it's a bad thing though, using emulation for a re-release like this makes a whole lot of sense. This would happen again over the years. The 2010 reboot of Splatterhouse, which we'll discuss later, includes the arcade game via emulation. The emulation isn't bad for the arcade version, but unfortunately it's poorly scaled using an aggressive bilinear filter, butchering the image quality in the process. It's great to have an official version of the original game on a home console in the West, of course, but I feel that it misses the mark thanks to the poor upscaling choice. In addition, the PC Engine slash TG16 version of Splatterhouse was released on multiple other devices using emulation, including Wii Virtual Console, the PlayStation Network, and even the TG16 Mini. Wii Virtual Console also received the arcade game. In each case, emulation is surprisingly solid and accurate. Beyond this, however, there was also an iPhone version and this My Arcade Gaming Namco Museum Mini Player Arcade Cabinet, which has Splatterhouse on it, though unfortunately I didn't have access to them for this video. But these were not the only attempts at bringing Splatterhouse home. So as it is me doing the voiceover, let's take a look at, shall we say, alternative ways to experience Splatterhouse. In 1988, Namco put out the handheld electronic LCD version of Splatterhouse. Now it is hard to review these types of experiences as games, as they only are meant to show simple approximations of the original, but what we have here is what we can loosely describe as Splattercon. Basically, you make your way up into the attic of a mansion, where the stage 3 boss for some reason holds Jennifer captive, while you avoid oncoming obstacles. It's a pretty familiar arcade setup, and at that, it's not too bad. As a handheld experience, in 1988, it's actually sort of fun in spurts, and the on-screen images are fairly cool as well. It's a fun collector's item, if anything. But the dream of a proper Splatterhouse handheld would not die, and in 2010, various um, dumb phones would get their version of Splatterhouse done in Java. But is it any good? Ho ho ho! No, not really. Though to be honest, I'm a bit surprised seeing how close they got to the original graphics here. Down to the lower spec Nokia phones even, as seen here. But controlling these on a keypad leads to some serious carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah, as mentioned, look at the graphics here, they are quite faithful. And Rick's mask seems to have had a slight redesign closer to the 2010 reboot design. A bit later, a higher resolution version was released for both numeric keypads and the new touch-based phones, and the graphics here especially impresses me. This is quite good at a glance. But they done goofed with them controls, and especially on touchpads, which is the only version I could actually sample on real hardware for this episode, and the delay between your input and the slow speed on-screen action really hampers the overall experience. It's a bit of a letdown, because I was very impressed by the first impressions, but playing it just isn't good. Overall though, it's quite fun to see these efforts be made to bring an arcade experience home in creative ways, but the experience today leaves a lot to be desired. Unless you're still rocking a brick Nokia phone though, then I say toot on sir, toot on, and spread the word on the Splatterhouse keypad experience which only you know the secrets of. Ultimately, what else is there to say about Splatterhouse? It was an important milestone for horror games and delivered a tone and narrative arc well ahead of its time. It was also one of the most recognizable home conversions on the PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16. It was successful enough, however, that the series would continue over to new platforms, with two proper sequels arriving on Sega's 16-bit Mega Drive. Before the arrival of these sequels, however, even before Splatterhouse arrived on PC Engine, there was another game released exclusively in Japan 
that we need to discuss. Namco was one of the Famicom's earliest and most notable supporters, but by 1989, Nintendo and Namco weren't exactly on the best of terms, following a public dispute regarding its contract renegotiations. Nevertheless, while Namco would begin to focus heavily on competing platforms, they did not cease production of Nintendo games. Which is where 1989's Splatterhouse Wanpaku Graffiti comes into play. Developed in partnership with contract studio Now Production, Wanpaku is a spin-off title which blends the themes of the original arcade game with a side of comedy, not unlike Konami's Parodius series which debuted the year prior on MSX. Now Production is a work-for-hire studio similar to Tosei that started back in 1986. In fact, its very first game, Metro Cross, was produced for Namco as well, the beginning of a long-lasting partnership. Oh, and for those curious about the Namcot logo on the box, this was simply the branding utilized for Namco's home console publishing efforts until the mid-90s. The premise begins with Rick being revived alongside the Pumpkin King, who immediately turns around and kidnaps his girlfriend Jennifer, then flies away. Thus, Tiny Rick jumps into action and the game begins. By the time you reach the end though, it's revealed that this was nothing more than a movie set. Now, this diminutive take on Rick is kind of a natural choice here given Famicom's limited hardware. The arcade game's gigantic sprites would have been difficult to deliver on a system like this, and thus, like many other Famicom conversions, the decision was made to alter the design to fit the hardware. Everything is scaled down as a result, but the core essence of Splatterhouse is still kind of there. The primary difference lies in the level design and progression. You'll still spend some of the time running forward, slashing away at foes while making strategic jumps over hazards, but there's now more variety here, including expanded rooms and vertical platforming sections. It feels like this middle ground between Splatterhouse and a more traditional NES-style platformer. Throughout the game, you'll encounter various pop culture references, including this early segment featuring Dracula and an unlicensed take on Michael Jackson's Thriller. It's not a stunning game though, but the dev team did utilize some cool tricks to enhance the presentation. First and foremost, several stages use horizontal interrupts to adjust portions of the screen at different rates. This gives the illusion of parallax scrolling, though of course these layers can never intersect, hence why it only works in these select stages that mainly just scroll to the right. It's especially clever in this lake stage, where the land in the background eventually scrolls off screen, with only the edge of the water remaining visible. This allows them to smoothly bring in the next more complex section where such a technique wasn't suitable. It's very cool. The color palette in general is dark and dingy, with a focus on browns, greens, and oranges, but it does suit the tone. Sprites are small, but reasonably expressive, and the soundtrack is super catchy. Problem is, for all these fun elements, the hit detection and general control lack some of the precision of the arcade game, and it definitely feels less satisfying to control. I don't think it's a bad game, Yes, it is. but I do feel it's less enjoyable than other mainline entries in the series. It's an average platform action game with some interesting concepts, basically. Still, if you're a fan of Splatterhouse, it's definitely one worth keeping an eye out for. Unfortunately, the game isn't exactly cheap these days, but there are other ways to play it. Thankfully, our next game is more in line with what Splatterhouse fans were looking for. Almost four years after Splatterhouse debuted in arcades, Namco teamed up once again with Now Production to develop and release a proper sequel with Splatterhouse 2, or Splatterhouse Part 2 as it's known in Japan. This time, the team targeted Sega's 16-bit powerhouse, the Mega Drive, or Genesis, and used the more powerful hardware to push the visual envelope while offering fans of the original game more of what they love. And let me tell you, Splatterhouse 2 is excellent. Now, narratively, Splatterhouse 2 kicks off with an unexpected twist. Jennifer is apparently still alive, and Rick is beckoned by the Terror Mask to save her, sending the player back into the thick of things, to a new house. 
But that's where the regional differences start to pop up. Despite featuring English text in the original Japanese version, the Western release is mostly rewritten and suggests that you're returning to the West Mansion once again. You know, the same mansion that had already burned to the ground in the first game. Yeah, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? Either way, once you dive in, the fundamentals are familiar. Splatterhouse 2 builds upon the design of the original arcade. It's still a single plane action game with a mix of combat and platforming, but there are some key improvements here. Firstly, there's these vertical stages, a staple of the brawling genre by this point. These sections see Rick taking an elevator or floating through some sort of portal-like thing while dealing with patterns of enemies. It lends the experience more variety in its presentation and gameplay, basically. The move to Sega's hardware also brings some immediate benefits to the table when it comes to the visuals. The first stage, for instance, immediately fills the screen with many different layers of parallax scrolling, including this richly detailed foreground layer, along with these foreboding clouds smoothly sailing across the darkened sky. In the second stage then, following a lengthy elevator ride, you'll make your way through this darkened tunnel where flickery visions of phantoms fill the air before arriving at the terrifying second boss, a screen-filling and bone-chilling depiction of an otherworldly horror. It's remarkable to behold, honestly, I love it. Overall scene complexity has increased with some truly outstanding background tile work used throughout, and sprites are now large with many frames of animation, just like the arcade game, I suppose. Plus, what about things like this, the graphic blood splat across the screen at the end of stage 3? There's a ton of this stuff in here. The game is way gorier than the original game, even. As you make your way to the game, there's a bit of a shift to psychological horror, with dithered transparencies and multi-layer scrolling used to great effect, producing some stunning set pieces in the process that really suit the mood. Beyond this, the soundtrack really suits the action, making excellent use of the sound capabilities of the Mega Drive hardware to produce haunting melodies such as this. In terms of releases, Splatterhouse 2 is effectively a Sega Mega Drive exclusive, having only appeared on the Virtual Console some years later and in the 2010 reboot as an unlockable. The Virtual Console version is perfectly fine, but the unlockable version in the 2010 release is not great. It features the same atrocious bilinear upscale blur we saw in the arcade game, but the real issue this time is the audio. The emulation of audio is simply terrible, something that was pretty common at the time with Genesis emulation. Take a listen. Ultimately, Splatterhouse Part 2 is exactly what the name suggests. It's more Splatterhouse, and it's good Splatterhouse. By 1992, though, the style of single-plane action game was no longer popular due to the rise of Final Fight and its clones, so I'm glad that Namco decided to stick it out with the formula one more time. When it comes to the next game, however, I guess things had to change.
released less than a year after the second game, Splatterhouse Part 3 marks Now Pro and Namco's final 16-bit entry in the series, but it also represents a huge shift in design. Now, I've been talking about Final Fight and Double Dragon in this video, right? Well, by 93, I suppose the only thing they could do is go after this formula, and they did it. But thankfully, they did so with a twist. When you first fire up the game, though, you're treated to this bizarre and moody introduction sequence featuring digitized close-ups representing Jennifer and Rick wearing a creepier version of the terror mask. The story is told using this technique, in fact. The imagery is downright unsettling at times, which is kind of impressive given the technical constraints. In-game, however, is where we see the biggest changes. Yes, Namco and Now Pro have given in to the pressure of the early 90s brawling environment and implemented proper depth movement, or Z movement. You can now walk around freely in each stage battling foes, much like Final Fight itself. The twist, however, stems from the progression system. Rather than simply walking through a linear level, each stage in Splatterhouse 3 has an actual map that's accessible by pressing the start button. The map shows your position and your objective, but how you get there is actually up to you. This allows for a more non-linear approach with secrets and power-ups to find along the way. It's a fresh take on the genre that was starting to feel worn out by this time, and it works. In addition, there's a time limit, but this time limit only impacts the story. You see, Jennifer and your son, David, yes, Rick has a son, are both in danger and their fate depends entirely upon your speed through the game. Finish off a boss in time and you'll push the narrative in a positive direction. Fail to hit that timer though and things start to go bad. This basically boils down to the game featuring multiple endings based on how well you do adding a lot of replay value in the process. So how does it actually play then? Well, honestly, pretty good. It's fast, responsive, and it feels solid. Definitely above average for this style of brawler. Unfortunately, the moveset itself is relatively limited and later creatures require a lot of damage to take down, which certainly can become tedious. It's completely lacking any of the platforming elements as well. It's just a brawler now. But I still respect what they've accomplished here either way. It stands as its own unique creation that feels like a natural evolution for the series. It's just a shame there aren't two terror masks for some multiplayer action. That really would have spiced things up. Now visually, it's also a great looking 1993 Mega Drive game. It features big sprites, tons of animation frames, and beautifully drawn environments to explore. Rick's design differs significantly by this point in the series, but I think it works well in this game. The sound design is also excellent, as is typical of the series, but the battle music can grow tiresome after a while. Feelings on this game differ from person to person. Splatterhouse purists tend to prefer the original Spartan X style action, while those more familiar with 90s brawlers often prefer Splatterhouse 3. I tend to fall into the former myself, but I do enjoy both of them, and I feel it's a great way to cap off the series, at least for a while. Splatterhouse 3 received even fewer re-releases, and original carts are unfortunately rather pricey. It did, however, appear in that 2010 reboot again as an unlockable for finishing the game. Unfortunately, it has the same issues as Splatterhouse 2. Poor by linear filtered visuals with terrible audio emulation. I mean, it's really bad. It's even missing notes at point. Just listen to this.
But there's more. The digitized scenes? Well, those were changed in this version with smoother shading and completely different people altogether. Perhaps this is the result of digitizing actual people for the original release? They likely wanted to sidestep any legal trouble here. But I think there might be more to it, as the number of colors used during these scenes seems to exceed what's actually possible on original hardware. So I have a suspicion that they're somehow injecting these alternate scenes into the ROM, basically overlaying the graphics. It's certainly a curious change. Ultimately, Splatterhouse 3 is a strong entry in the series and well worth checking out, even if you prefer that original style of gameplay. But its release basically marked the end of the series for many years. Namco did not fully forget about Splatterhouse, though. Rick appeared in numerous other games from Namco, and the Splatterhouse credits theme, based on Alessandro Scarlatti's song Sento Nel Cor, was remixed for We Love Katamari many years later, referencing Splatterhouse in the track name. So yeah, Splatterhouse had never been truly forgotten, and in 2007, the decision was made to revive the series. July 29th, 2002. The PlayStation 2 was dominating the sales chart and Sony San Diego Studio had just released a brand new first party game known as The Mark of Cree. This gorgeous action stealth title was the result of 2D animators getting into game development and working to build something that delivers a truly fluid and fast design in 3D. Kree features a fascinating combat system that involves assigning buttons to your foes by sweeping the right analog stick around the arena and pressing the correct button in response. It was inventive and extremely well received at the time to the point that it even received a sequel known as Rise of the Kasai three years later. And that sequel was developed by a studio known as Bottle Rocket Entertainment, a developer formed primarily by San Diego Studios employees that had previously worked on The Mark of Cree. So what does this have to do with Splatterhouse then? Well that's the thing. This team was selected by Namco in 2007 to bring the series back on new HD consoles, namely PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. And it seemed like a good fit. After all, most of the Splatterhouse console games had been developed with the help of an external partner anyways, so why not this one? The studio was talented, clearly. Well, that's the thing. Development got underway, but unfortunately the results never seemed to be to Namco's specifications from what we understand. This continued for quite some time, in fact, until suddenly Namco pulled the plug. The studio was closed, and development would continue under a new banner. A new studio was formed in Carlsbad, with some of the Bottle Rocket staff making their way to this new location to continue the game. Eventually, this new studio managed to cross the finish line, but the original Halloween release date had been missed, and the game it wasn't exactly well received by critics. So, how was it? Well, prior to the production of this video, I hadn't actually played it before, but now I have, and there's definitely a lot to say. Firstly, the game kicks off with a cheesy pre-rendered introduction sequence, showing Rick waking up in a pool of his own blood, his girlfriend nowhere to be seen. It's kind of familiar, but the game now features full voice acting, as you'd expect for 2010, but this also includes the terror mask itself, which comes fully equipped with plenty of tood. Who am I? Let's just say I'm God. Your God. At least the only God that's listening right now. What do I want? Uh, same as any God. Little faith. For without faith, I am nothing. And without The entire tone of the game just feels remarkably cheesy, like new metal infused horror. I'm not a big fan of the actual character designs or the animation work either. Everything feels exaggerated in a way that doesn't really suit the horror-like atmosphere you would have hoped they'd aim for. Once you jump into the game though, it's immediately clear what Splatterhouse 2010 had become, and it does kind of make sense given the time frame. Basically, the reboot seems to have been greatly influenced by games such as God of War. It's a full 3D brawler that often locks players in a room until all foes are properly dealt with. It's exactly what you would expect from an action game of this era. Problem is, the actual combat is not especially satisfying. 
You have your basic light and heavy attacks and upgrade system and various other mechanics to deal with, but fights tend to drag on just a little too long and it never really feels as solid as its contemporaries. The game essentially has you making your way through the various environments, engaging in combat, while solving an occasional puzzle or two along the way before reaching the next cutscene and or boss. In one of the more unusual crossovers, Namco struck a deal with Playboy during its marketing phase, and this manifests in the game in the form of torn photos scattered around the mansion. Pick up the pieces and you're rewarded with uh, poorly rendered softcore photographs, I suppose. I'm not entirely sure the art team was really up to this task, to be honest. Then there's the soundtrack, which strikes a very different tone from the originals, with Howard Drossing taking the lead on the music. It's not entirely bad, but it feels slightly uninspired, I might say. Honestly, not necessarily bad feels like an apt description for Splatterhouse. It plays okay with a nod here and there to the original games, but it doesn't work that well in the end. I understand the reasoning behind rebooting the game in this style, but it feels like they didn't fully understand the appeal of the original titles. Unfortunately, it has technical issues on top of this. The game was built using Gamebryo of all things. Splatterhouse runs very poorly on both consoles, but especially on PlayStation 3. The very first battle basically averages out to 20 frames per second with dips as low as 12 frames per second in the heaviest moments. I believe that this is down to the blood splatter and number of on-screen enemies. As you can see, it's rather dire. It really isn't very fun playing a brawler like this when the frame rate is dropping to these levels. Now, normal exploration segments aren't too bad. They mostly hit 30 frames per second, and the smaller battles can run reasonably okay, or at least remain playable, I suppose, but anytime the action heats up and blood starts flying around, the performance drops into the toilet, making for a very unresponsive game. It does seem to be slightly better on Xbox 360, but I wasn't able to run the analysis tool on this one as the footage I have for that version was provided by a friend of the show, Corey Carlson from My Life in Gaming, and unfortunately the compression made frame detection somewhat inaccurate. Either way, I think you can see for yourself. Resolution-wise, both versions seem to run at 1024 by 576 with 2x MSAA and share the same basic visuals, so there's not much to compare here. It is, however, a stark reminder of how terrible average performance could be during that generation of consoles. Remember, Digital Foundry started during this era, and there was a good reason for that. Games were launching constantly with really lousy performance, sometimes much worse on one console or the other even. Things have changed dramatically these days. Usually we have solid 30 FPS, solid 60 FPS, and when there are issues, the dips are relatively minor. But then you look back at games like this, and, well, it's a reminder of just how bad things used to be. Ultimately, Splatterhouse 2010 was a disappointment, but it still managed to find a cult following. The poor graphics performance, mindless combat, and juvenile writing drag down the experience, but it's not inherently a bad game, just a, an average one. The inclusion of the original trilogy is a nice bonus, but again, they all suffer from noticeable technical limitations. Still, if you're a fan of Splatterhouse, I do think it's worth checking out just to see how certain concepts were adapted by the new game. Unfortunately, the game was not a smash hit, and given the developmental difficulties, it likely spells the end for the franchise as we know it. Oh.
that marks the end of the Splatterhouse series as we know it today. Looking back, it's clear that there's still a lot to love in this series, and it has had a huge impact on other series going forward. Whenever you mention the name Splatterhouse, though, you're almost inevitably going to run into a fan. This game had a huge impact on people who were there at the time, and it is absolutely fondly remembered. It also harkens back to a very different era when developers would see a new movie or read a book and say, you know what, let's make a game based on these themes, I like it, and then they just do it. But while that marks the end of the Splatterhouse series for the time being, the Terror Mask can always make a return. Oh!